So in this work, uh, we're interested in the RSA signatures in TLS. We're interested in w particular whether faulty RSA signatures uh, are capable of leaking, are leaking private keys in the wild. Uh, now, uh, recall that TLS here is used to uh, establish secure connections between clients and servers, and that during this, the handshake process, uh, RSA signing is used uh, RSA signing is used to uh, authenticate the identity of uh, different hosts in the handshake. Now, previous work has shown that, RSA, that active attackers can exploit faulty RSA signatures to recover private keys. What we're interested here in is whether such an attack can be carried out completely passively and whether uh, servers are currently leaking their uh, RSA keys on the internet. Uh, to answer that question, uh, we collected uh, billions of RSA signatures and found that servers are leaking their private keys. Uh, we found more than 100 private keys, including uh, several key keys for real sites, uh, including Baidu.com, one of the largest uh, websites uh, in the world. Um, now, Okay, so to understand how simple faults in RSA signatures can leak private keys, we need to briefly review RSA. Uh, so if you recall here, we've got Alice and Bob, and uh, RSA is a digital signature uh, scheme that allows Bob to authenticate, to prove to Alice that he's the owner of a particular private key, and he does that by signing a message and uh, sending the message and the signature to Alice. Uh, for, in the case of TLS, this is uh, the the fact that, it depend, that the, his identity depends solely on his ownership of a private key is important because if an attacker can uh, recover a private key from a website, then they're able to impersonate uh, the server, that server, and uh, clients are, can't tell, won't be able to tell the difference between uh, messages coming from Bob, messages coming from the attacker, or messages coming from the actual server. Now, in practice, uh, this textbook version of RSA is not actually used because it's seen as too slow. In practice, a, most implementations use a version that relies on the Chinese remainder theorem uh, to speed things up. Uh, to do this, Bob, instead of generating a signal center, generates the signature in two parts, one module of P and one module of Q, and then combines those into a signal, single signature that can be verified uh, as before. So the, the importance of this is that it, it is uh, more efficient and so is what is used in practice. However, it introduces uh, problems of severe uh, problems if Bob makes a mistake while computing either part of the uh, signature. If he, can, if he compute, say he compute, makes a mistake while computing the part modulo Q, he then generates a faulty signature that, where the main problem is that it is, while it's congruent to the correct signature modulo P, it's not, correct, it's not congruent modulo Q. This means that an eavesdropper who sees the message and the faulty signature can do a simple GCD cal calculation to recover P and thereby uh, get Bob's private key. Now, to do this, to do this calculation, the, she needs to know, be able to both reconstruct the message and see the faulty signature. Conveniently, in TLS uh, versions 1.2 and below, both of these conditions are met. Uh, because the signature is sent in the clear, and all of the and the uh, PK, PKC and if PKCS uh, 1.5 padding is used, then um, then the message can be uh, reconstructed from data that the uh, the that she can observe. Now, this is not a new attack. In fact, it was described for, described in, back, way back in 1997 by Bonet, Milo, Lipton, and Lenstra. And almost immediately, it was, began to be used in what turned out to be a long string of side channel work that used induced faults and attacker controlled hardware uh, to recover RSA keys. Uh, then in two, 2015, Weimer extended this work by showing that it could be, uh, that this vulnerability could be exploited completely remotely. He did this by making lots of uh, TLS connections to servers on the internet and then waiting for them to make natural faults. So he wasn't inducing any faults. He was just expecting that they would make faults, and then he recovered uh, faulty signatures and thereby was able to recover a number of private keys. Now, while OpenSSL patched back in 2001, Weimer's work spurred a number of other libraries to uh, patch their implementations uh, in light of his, the keys he, he recovered. Okay, so now we're in 2022. 
This vulnerability has been known for 25 years, and most of the major libraries have patched. So I guess why am I standing up here, right? This should be, this should be a solved problem. So to answer that question, uh, we collected a bunch of data. Uh, we collected data on uh, UCSD Wi-Fi network and the CU Boulder campus network. As you can see from the graph, we collected this data over eight months. And as you can tell from the flat lines at the bottom, uh, collecting this amount of data, we ran into various technical difficulties uh, that hampered collection. But overall, nonetheless, we were able to uh, collect uh, 5.8 billion handshakes, and we collected and validated 2.7 billion signatures. Uh, the difference between 2.7 and 5.8 there is largely due to TLS 1.3, which uh, doesn't send the signatures in a way that, that encrypts the signatures so a bystander cannot see them. So the main message from this is that, we ended, that servers are sending out uh, non-validating signatures. We found 1,700, and we managed to, find, to factor uh, the keys in 11 connections. Uh, all of these came from uh, Baidu.com, and we disclosed to Baidu, and they were able to they, uh, change their keys and then uh, patch their code by verifying uh, the signatures before they were sending them out. OK, but as I said, this uh, is a known vulnerability. So how did uh, Baidu end up uh, with this problem? There are two main parts of the, the problem. They, um, so they were, as many, uh, as many websites do, they, since signatures, signatures are expensive, they offloaded the signatures to a hardware accelerator. Unfortunately, when they did this, they managed to bypass the uh, checks that had been introduced into the library. And so once the hardware began to fail, they started sending out uh, faulty signatures over the wire, which allowed us to factor, factor with using a single bad signature, we were able to recover keys. Uh, the two, if you look at the plot on, on the right, these shows the number of connections we saw every day, and the asterisks at the bottom indicate uh, when we saw the f uh, factored keys. Now, there are two things to notice about this. First, uh, you can notice that they're all clumped together. Going into this work, we were somewhat expecting that uh, we would see isolated faults due to uh, cosmic rays or uh, voltage problems or whatever. But you can see that they're actually tightly clumped together. And this suggests that perhaps there's an ongoing uh, hardware fault. Uh, further, you can see that these errors are very rare. And that highlights the importance of using passive data collection to uh, see enough signatures over a long enough period of time that you're likely to see these concentrated, uh, unlikely faults. OK, one of the drawbacks of passive scanning, though, is that you're limited to uh, whatever users on your network are connecting to. So we supplemented our passive collection with uh, act data from active TLS scans. Uh, this came from two places. We will, first, we looked back at historical scans from 2015 to 2020, to 2020 uh, where we were able to examine 44 scans. Here you see the data from 2015. It's partly interesting because it, uns I guess unsurprisingly, it confirms uh, those categories are similar to what Weimer found in his research at about the same time. Um, so that's nice. And then the other thing uh, to notice is, we, so we were able to collect all this data from 2015. Unfortunately, after that, the data we had access to stopped collecting some of the cryptographic information that we needed and stopped collecting uh, handshakes that failed, which f handshakes with faulty signatures should fail. So we, after 2015, we were, had less visibility. But from what we could see, it appears that these faults can, uh, continued over this time. They didn't magically reappear in 2022 when we started looking for them again. Now, uh, as I said, we also did our own active scanning. We did this with scans of the full IPv4 space over three weeks during uh, May and June of this year. Uh, during this time, we were able to factor 73 keys. And as you can see from all the blue up there, uh, the majority of the keys we found uh, were from Cisco and they turned out to be, I think, part of their VPN uh, infrastructure that they provide. Um, we disclosed this to Cisco, and they should be releasing a patch uh, today. Um, we also, among the, the dots over on the right, there's some other uh, kind of internet devices, like such as more VPN stuff, and also uh, uh, several uh, real websites. Um, 
Again, as with the Baidu, where you can see that these weren't scattered failures, but that once a, you know, the hard piece of hardware starts failing, it continues. Uh, we can see that, uh, that, especially with the Cisco there on the left, but with all of them, you can see that they, once a key appears, we're likely to see it uh, again later. Okay, so that's what we did. We, uh, we did some passive data collection. We looked at some old scans, and we did some new scanning. And uh, yeah, we factored, factored some keys, including uh, one from Baidu. But now I'd like to take a brief look back at the, the time period, if you remember, between 1997 and when the uh, vulnerability was described, and 2015, when most of the, by which point most of the major libraries had patched. And suggest that during this time, uh, this vulnerability would have been ideal for a powerful adversary who had the capability to collect a large amounts of internet traffic. There are several reasons why this would have been good. In the first place, uh, as we've seen, key compromise and key exchange recovery were both passively, uh, completely passively exploitable, so the endpoints wouldn't know that you were collecting this data. Uh, next, before TLS 1.3, keys were used for both signatures and key exchange, so once you got uh, a private key, you could read all of the uh, data that was using RSA key exchange. And we know that back in 2011 from leaked documents that 95% of TLS connections uh, were using RSA key exchange, meaning that you would have a lot of traffic to read. It might be less likely that you would see a RSA signature because of RSA key exchange, but if you had a large amount of traffic, that's unlikely that that's a problem. And finally, and also since most libraries didn't patch until 2015, that would, you'd probably see more faults than we're seeing uh, today. So in short, it seems to be an, uh, an ideal vulnerability for a nation state size adversary to exploit. Okay, so after that speculative look backwards, uh, what did we learn today? The main thing we learned was that you should uh, validate your signatures before sending, because if you don't, you're in danger of a single faulty signature leaking uh, your private key, which is not a good thing. We also uh, learned the benefits of some of the, t the implementation changes made by TLS 1.3, the switch from a uh, deterministic uh, PKCS 1.5 padding scheme to a non-deterministic PSS uh, padding scheme. The fact that RSA key exchange uh, is no longer used, so even if you do recover a key, uh, you won't be able to read uh, traffic. And um, the, finally, that the, the signature and the message components are now encrypted. So it makes it uh, harder for a passive adversary to uh, do the attack. Uh, finally, from the Baidu stuff, we've learned that new, introducing new hardware and software into your stack can cause unexpected problems. And I guess that's it. So finally, the paper has uh, some slight more information about an ECDSA vulnerability that we also found while doing this research and uh, information about PSS padding. Thank you, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions now.